it does feel like we approach this session and today's discussions at a point of inflection phrase or at a point of fragmentation. And I also feel like I say this every time I sit down with panellists at an event like this, but it does really feel like so many of the changes and developments just come thick and heavy with the news flow. Before we get underway, I just wanted to pick up on what Philip was saying earlier about the interactive nature of this event. So if we could maybe do a test poll. If you're joining us in person, you can scan the QR code on your table um, and you can access it via the Asia Society link. But that's a poll there. If you could respond and we can see if uh, that's working. If you're joining us online, it's just on the menu bar to the side, to the left side of your screen as well. So the test poll question, which of course is a very pertinent one, is, is Asia at a reflection point in, at an inflection point, I should say, in 2021. I suspect that should be 2022. It's a pretty overwhelming answer there. So throughout the course of the discussions today, we'll be bringing up some of these um, polls and it's always really interesting to see what the responses are as we get to the end of the discussions of the day. Uh, let me get started. And as Philip introduced me as, I'm Heidi Stroud Watts. I'm from Bloomberg Television here in Australia, and it's a pleasure to host these discussions for you again today. Let me start off with you in terms of setting the scene as to what's going on in the world as we gather today. It's a time of, and I keep saying the term unprecedented, but it really does seem relevant that we've got this prolonged conflict in Ukraine. We have potentially more tensions when it comes to the Taiwan Strait, not to mention, of course, a period of really heightened uh, hawkishness from North Korea as well. Does it feel like we're on the cusp of the battle of power politics here in Asia? Thank you. I think uh, let me begin by thanking Philip and the Asia Society Australia team for, for inviting me and for Bloomberg for supporting this. I'd also like to vote uh, saying there is yes vote for the inflection point. I think uh, there's no escaping that. I think uh, we've seen that. Second, I, I would say fragmentation is a good word to capture what is going on. Uh, you can see it clearly at three, three levels, the fragmentation that is taking place. One, uh, end of the Cold War, uh, 91 on the day, uh, a harmonious relationship between the major powers. Uh, everyone was getting along with everyone, but now the crisis in Europe, as well as the what's happening in uh, in Asia, uh, that thing is fragmented. That today there are rival coalitions. You have U.S. and uh, and the West on one side. You have Russia and China, who signed up an, an, an accord. So I think that conflict uh, we're going to live with it uh, for quite some time. The second uh, aspect is the globalization of the integration of the world if you will, was the main feature of post-1991 world. Uh, this WTO, whether it was trading arrangements uh, across the world. So now we have, have actually the beginnings of a fragmentation of uh, an integrated world. Now they talk about decoupling, deglobalization. Those have become the buzzwords. And I think uh, where we saw between US and China, the un unraveling the expansive interdependence that emerged. Uh, is already beginning to unfold. The third aspect of the fragmentation is uh, post-91, we saw an expansive growth in uh, technological revolution, a revolution that fundamentally transformed the way we organize production, distribution, and the nature of the very uh, nature of the economies themselves. Now, it was quite easy where we saw American venture capital supporting Chinese innovators. You had Chinese, you know, telecommunication parts in the Indian side. So, but I think we're beginning to see a breakdown of that as well, that the recent announcement by the U.S. on the chips, uh, semiconductor sanctions against the, against China, it tells you the technological world too is going to be, is going to be fragmented. So I think we are in a, a real fragmented world, but this is different from the Cold War period uh, for two reasons. One, in the Cold War of the past, it was Asia, Europe that was at the primary theater. But this time, a risen Asia or the Indo-Pacific is the primary theater. So I think most of the consequences of the new Cold War will be in Asia. And I think Asia is going to be more directly engaged with this, uh, with this confrontation. So, so I would say that 
uh, one final thought on the democracies versus autocracies. In the Cold War, we saw, I mean, the idea of democracies versus autocracies. You know, communism did not really pan out like that. I mean, you had coalitions that were much more complicated on both sides. I suspect we're going to see the same thing again this time. There will be a wider set of coalitions on both sides and not just democracies versus autocracies. You know, Katrina, for a nation, a middle nation like Australia, the question is always where do we fall at a time of these great power politics, right? The coalitions that we just spoke about. As Philip mentioned, obviously the new government has hit the ground running with a lot of domestic challenges that have been at the forefront. In terms of foreign policy and the strategic approach in the Indo-Pacific, where, where are we at? How would you define the direction that's been taken? Uh, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Heidi, and thanks to the Asia Society for the invitation to participate today. And um, it's terrific to be here in Victoria. And you mentioned challenges and domestic challenges, and you know we're seeing uh, we're seeing a ter terrible extreme and we're out here in Victoria and across Australia, which are not unrelated to to the international environment. So our thoughts are also very much with those people who are suffering. Uh, but it is a very difficult and challenging uh, period. Uh, uh, the government has certainly hit the ground running uh, national sphere, as you say, uh, and has been uh, very active in engaging with the countries of the region. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister was, uh, was on an aeroplane to Tokyo just shortly after being, uh, being sworn in uh, to attend the Quad uh, leaders' meeting. Uh, but in a macro sense, what Australia uh, uh, seeks, the vision for Australia in the region, is that you know, we, we are living in a region that is peaceful, that is stable, that is prosper, prosperous, a region in which um, the rules and the norms are understood and followed, where we can trade freely, where we can thrive, where we can cooperate, and where we can participate as equal sovereign nations. So we're, our vision is for, the government's vision is for a region where countries are free to make their own sovereign choices including who they partner with, uh, and that all countries in the region uh, uh, have a voice. And there are some very long-standing and very effective uh, organisations and mechanisms in the region, uh, including, of course, um, ASEAN, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum, which have been uh, in existence for decades, and the broader ASEAN architecture. Uh, we very much see uh, ASEAN as holding the centre of the Indo-Pacific region and all those countries coming together in a very disciplined way with very clear rules around how they engage and having not only their national interests uh, in mind but also the regional interests. So a strategic equilibrium is really what we are seeking in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, a region where um, countries have options, countries are free to choose and we work together and partner with them. And if you uh, listen to uh, the comments of the foreign minister, prime minister, uh, we really, uh, the government is travelling, the government is listening very carefully to the aspirations, to the challenges that the countries in the region face and seeking to continue to partner with them uh, to jointly address those, those challenges. Evan, I wanted to get a question to you about, and in fact, Katrina was just talking about the, the op optionality of partnerships across the region. And one of those optionality questions is how we deal with China and Russia and how, in fact, that partnership goes forward. Because we have heard about this no limits friendship between President Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. I wonder if there are now limits given how prolonged the war in Ukraine has gone on. Is it a friendship that is extended to the joint desire to counteract and counterbalance the influence of Washington? Does it go further than that? And how does, I guess, Beijing also seek to benefit from uh, some of the detriment to, to Russia's role, particularly in Central Asia? Well, thanks, Heidi. First, let me say that I, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you to the Asia Society. It's nice to see Raja and Katrina on stage. I haven't seen either of you since before the pandemic. So thanks, thanks for having me. 
Um, you know, it's interesting in talking about a no limits friendship, you're obviously quoting the Russia China joint statement from just before the Beijing Olympics in early February. Um, I've been around international politics a long time in and out of government. There's no such thing as a no limits relationship. All relationships have limits and the Russia China relationship has limits no less than any other. China is a multi dimensional power with multifaceted interests. It has strategic interests, financial interests, economic interests, diplomatic interests. And so not surprisingly, it's had to try to find ways to balance those with Russia because it's a much more global player and it is a much more multidimensional player in the international system than Russia is. So when Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, China essentially went into the crisis having to reconcile a series of competing interests that, from my vantage point at least, are fundamentally irreconcilable. At the strategic level, you've cracked the code, which is that neither Russia nor China particularly likes the trajectory of American foreign policy. They're deeply ambivalent in some ways about one another, but each of them in their own way and for their own reasons is vastly more ambivalent about American foreign policy and the way American power has been used. So at the strategic level, China has leaned very hard into its partnership with Moscow. And that's particularly true if you compare where Beijing is with Russia today to where it was in, say, 2008, when Russia had a dry run for what it's doing in Ukraine by invading Georgia and detaching two regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. At that point, China not only didn't endorse Russian actions, it rallied some of the opposition among, for example, Central Asian countries who you mentioned in groups like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So counterbalancing American power is one reason they've leaned in as hard as they have now, and they've leaned even harder than they have in the past. But having said that, China has a $15 trillion economy, and in no sector and in no area is commercial or financial relations with Russia more important to China than global market access. And so it's had the competing interest of trying to keep a target off its back for American and European and global sanctions. And those things are fundamentally irreconcilable, Heidi, because the more China leans into the partnership with Russia, obviously the more it paints the target on its back for sanctions. Um, and so they've had to basically do what I call the Beijing straddle where they tack uncomfortably back and forth between their strategic and their operational and tactical interests. So where we've ended up is basically with a strategic lean by the Chinese into Russia and vice versa, but uh, not a lot of tactical or operational support from China for the Russian campaign in Ukraine per se, and broadly speaking, Chinese compliance with the sanctions. Now, if you flip to Moscow, the Russians are pretty desperate because they don't have a lot of alternatives. So I think Russia is stuck in the position of being essentially the supplicant and having its economy increasingly tied to Chinese demands um, in ways that didn't need to be the case and are not the case had Mr. Putin not done what he did. But I expect China to try to continue this straddle for as long as possible. And I think really you've cracked the code when you talk about counterbalancing American power. That's what the strategic game is about. But Russia is in some ways a wasting asset for China there. We've obviously seen the economic impact of the prolonged war in Ukraine play out all around the world. Of course, the impact on supply chains, the impact on uh, agricultural and, and, and inflation. But I'm wondering Ivan, what you see as being the, the, the short and also the long-term impact on geopolitical uh, stance and, and security in Asia, because does it seem like with every military failure we could be getting closer to a Putin nuclear option, and what does that potentially signal for, say, Pyongyang, watching this from afar? Gosh, well... Um... Well, I mean, that's a concern. I think to be candid with you, most countries in the region are look at Ukraine as a distant conflict um, and largely regard it as something that's uh, not directly touching their interests. I think that's true of countries all across Southeast Asia. Um, it's why a lot of them have straddled on this diplomatically. Um, in Northeast Asia, well, what we've seen is Japan and South Korea in particular join the United States in imposing some of these sanctions. And we've seen a growing concern about uh, 
really what this means, not least in terms of what lessons China might draw from it for uh, the possibility of military conflict in the region itself. A lot of people have tried to draw, for example, straight line comparisons between Russia's actions in Ukraine and putative Chinese actions against Taiwan, for example, or as you suggested, that North Korea would take advantage of a moment of crisis to kick up trouble, stir up trouble. Um, as, it, as it happens, North Korea is taking advantage of the moment to stir up trouble, but there's nothing new under the sun in that respect. Um, you know, North Korea is a kind of strategic narcissist. They're constantly uh, seeking attention. They use the military tools at their disposal to do that. Um, and the United States for the last couple of administrations has chosen to not really uh, play to Pyongyang's tune. And so I think the broader concern, particularly in the United States where I'm sitting, is what conclusions China might draw from Russian actions and what it might mean for China's own policy toward Taiwan. We can come back to this if you'd like and discuss it later. But all I'd say at the headline level is that Xi Jinping is not Vladimir Putin. Um, Taiwan is not Ukraine. China is not Russia. Um, before February 24th, when Russia invaded Ukraine, China had spent 25 to 30 years acquiring tools in a very robust and multi dimensional kit bag of coercion. They've been thinking about it a long time, and I think a lot of those straight line comparisons are facile. The Chinese threat to Taiwan is substantial and it's real, and China is attempting to use coercive tools every day, not just kinetic ones, but economic ones, as you and Australia have discovered as well. So um, that's a focus in the United States, quite apart from these questions about nuclear use or non-use at the tactical level in Ukraine. But I think, um, I think broadly speaking, it's accelerated the debate about deterrence here in the United States in particular, but also across the region. I think strategic narcissism is now my favorite insult <laughs> to use. Um, at this point, I want to bring up uh, one of the polling questions, which is very pertinent to what we've been discussing, which is really asking the question as to what you see as the greatest threat to global peace and security as we sit now. And the options are obviously, as we've been talking about the Russian-Ukraine war, as we've just been spoke, speaking about the uh, Taiwan Strait tensions, rate rises is an interesting one because we've also seen the start of this tug of war between governments and central banks, as we've obviously seen in the UK, uh, the government there and the BOE really being on divergent paths when it comes to uh, what they see as being the appropriate path back to rate normality. The crisis on the Korean Peninsula is one of them as well. And then the last one, which obviously also ties into the Russia-Ukraine war, is food insecurity and the energy crisis. So the energy crisis, very interestingly at the moment, is uh, the leader when it comes to the biggest threat to global peace and security. So we'll keep that up for a little while and, um, and get the answers as the responses do come in. Shafi, I wanted to get to you about, in terms of how countries and governments within the Indo-Pacific are really reacting to this environment of power politics and the potential for conflict. When it comes to players like Indonesia and India, what do you see there as the way that policymakers are navigating this? Well, I think in, in, I mean, not just in Indonesia, but I think in Southeast Asia in general, um, the sentiment is that we feel like Southeast Asia is being a central arena to uh, great power politics and any uh, increased tension would impact on us um, directly most of the time, um, including, you know, for example, when we were discussing about Indo-Pacific um, and there are competing narratives of what Indo-Pacific is. Uh, and Southeast Asia has been the receiving end of this competing narratives on Indo-Pacific. But the concern is that, you know, none of this seem to really um, serve in, uh, Southeast Asia's interests yet massively uh, impact the region. So, you know, for, for Indonesia, um, our um, uh, general policy is to seek better relations and balance relations with um, as many countries as possible. Um, we also seek um, to do more through ASEAN. So, for example, trying to shift the narratives of um, Indo-Pacific to be a more um, um, cooperative one um, through ASEAN. Um, but I think um, in general, um, uh, there has not been any major shift of, of, of policy changes in terms of uh, looking at from, from, from Indonesia, but um, the, uh, the eagerness to actually um, create better relations with all of the major powers is still the number one um, strategy, I suppose. Raja, what about India? Are we seeing more and more of a convergence of common strategy between Washington and Delhi, particularly when it comes to countering, as, as we've heard over the weekend from Xi Jinping, just a doubling down of 
the assertiveness of Beijing? Yeah. No, I think uh, India's default orientation will remain non-aligned. You know, keep distance from these conflicts between the US and China. Uh, but what's happened in the last decade is the sharpening of the India-China conflict. That uh, we had a series of military crises uh, on the border, 2013, 2014, 2017, and 2020, and the last crisis is still continuing. Uh, and in the last crisis, we saw China actually undo three decades of confidence building agreements between India and, India and China. So now, so I think as China takes a posture on the border and more strategically in the Indo-Pacific, uh, India is today uh, trying to build the US, uh, Australia, Japan, uh, in order to produce that equilibrium, which... Uh, uh, we, we heard. So the idea for India is, look, Chinese power, if it becomes increasingly aggressive, you will have use of changing borders. Uh, India now sees so the option it has is one, use its own means to stand, you know, to stand up on the border, as well as build a coalition with other powers, US and its uh, Asian allies. So I think there's a big shift in India's uh, approach. And I think the Chinese have really pushed India into doing this because, as I said, even four years ago, they would have said, you know, we don't want anything to do with this crisis. But today, they're much closer to the West than they've been ever been before. But broadly, I would say in Asia, I mean, I think it's not a question. But for India, Japan, which are facing daily music, PLA music on their frontiers, uh, I think they would far more decisively won to strengthen their own defense capabilities and to build external balancing through coalitions uh, with, with other powers. Katerina, the relationship between Canberra and Beijing has, the status quo has not been great for the past few years. There has been signs recently of sort of green shoots of progress. We've heard about these multiple meetings between the foreign ministers, Penny Wong and Wang Yi. But does it feel like this is a relationship where we take one step forward and a few steps back? How would you gauge how that dynamic is being handled by the new government? Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Well, I'd, I'd start by saying that um, Australia's relationship with China is important. It's a key partner. It's our largest trading partner, and uh, the relationship uh, will be important into the, the future as well. Um, you have uh, have referred to some recent meetings uh, by the new government. Um, a meeting, a first meeting actually, between our Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Defence Minister Richard Miles with his counterpart in the margins of the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, very early on. And then two meetings between Foreign Minister Wong and her counterpart Wong Yi, uh, firstly in the margins um, of the G20. I was present at that meeting and then the second in the margins of the General Assembly. All of those meetings have been constructive uh, and they've all been steps forward. Um, so what Australia is, is seeking to do is stabilise the relationship. Uh, it'll take time. It'll be step by step. Uh, I think we'll see a very calm and measured approach um, from the government in doing that. Um, we're very keen to see um, the trade uh, trade flowing, uh, the blockages uh, being removed, so that both countries can can benefit from that mutual trade. Um, Australia is keen to cooperate uh, with China where we can. Climate change is a good example of that. Uh, but Australia will disagree uh, where it must, and it will uh, uh, continue to to raise issues uh, where it considers it appropriate, whether that's bilateral issues, or regional issues. Uh, consular issues. Uh, so the key, I think, Heidi, is to um, to stabilise the bilateral relationship between between China and Australia. Evan, is stabilisation of the relationship between Washington and Beijing a possibility? We're what a few weeks out from the midterms, and I think being tough on China that stance is one of probably the few positions that garner bipartisan support in Washington. When you take a look at that relationship. And if we accept it as being the great strategic competition of our time, is there a best case scenario where we can walk back from the brink of decoupling of these two economies? Well, I mean, to be candid, I, I think there's been a wholesale change in the relationship in the last, I'd say, five to seven years. I've been involved with US-China relations for 25 years. And I think we're in a fundamentally different place than we've been for the last few decades. If you rewind the clock 
even just seven, eight years, basically what you had was a broadly cooperative relationship with heavy doses of competition in it. And now what we have is a broadly competitive relationship with heavy doses of what I would call adversarial antagonism to it. And I don't see much sign that that's going to change. And the reason for that, I think, is largely structural. You know, people say that strategic or ideological competition is new in the U.S.-China relationship. And I'll tell you, it's not new. The modern inception of the U.S.-China relationship was Richard Nixon's February 1972 visit to China. And if you rewind the clock to that point in time, the United States and China were fighting a proxy war in Vietnam, and China was just crawling out of the Cultural Revolution. So from the very inception, there were clashing security concepts and there were obvious differences of political system and ideology. So what changed and enabled a more cooperative relationship was the development of an economic and commercial and financial interaction particularly after China came in the World Trade Organization in 2001. And you had these flows of goods, capital, people, technology, data that proceeded, uh, not in spite of the security relationship, but really on a separate track. And so I think what's happened in the last few years is that economics and security have basically collapsed together. And where they proceeded on separate but disconnected tracks for a while, and if you talk to people in corporate boardrooms or market people, they were not unaware of the security issues, but they never impinged on business models or on the trade. And what's happened is they've collapsed together, and now those commercial flows of capital, people, technology, and data, to a lesser extent goods, are being refracted through the prism of national security. And I don't see much sign that that's going to change. And I will tell you that technology, as you may have noticed, particularly because the Biden administration ordered up a new series of export control regulations last week, um, is particularly vulnerable to that. Because if you look at the emerging and foundational technologies of the future, AI-enabled applications, quantum computing, new synthetic and composite materials, all of these things are intrinsically dual use. And so when they're refracted through that security prism, the things that like commercial interaction or co-innovation that provided ballast to the relationship, I see no sign that they'll be looked at anymore, particularly in the United States, as commercial goods, much less as public goods. So that's a very new setup. And that's before you get to, as you implied, the politicization of the relationship. And there's a Chinese analog to that if you flip to the Beijing side of the equation, too. So I think that's what we're going to be looking at for the next several years. And, um, you know, there are opportunities to put guardrails around this, as Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, says, to prevent outright conflict. But um, structurally, I think we're just in a very different place today. Javier, yeah, I found it interesting that everyone's talking about the sort of optics of, of nationalization and how that potentially plays into an environment of increased militarization and security policy in the Indo-Pacific. For example, with AUKUS, I'm curious as to see how partners like Indonesia view this agreement. Um, absolutely. I mean, what um, Evan was explaining about, um, there is indeed um, um, military modernization uh, uh, throughout Indo-Pacific, and I think some latest reports already confirmed this. And I think this follows the general trend that um, there is increasing tension in the region as well. Um, and, um, um, and but, the, but there are at the same time several initiatives um, um, by several countries, like you mentioned, AUKUS. Um, from the Indonesian point of view, I think um, AUKUS is generally seen um, uh, as part of a, of a wider strategic competition between the U.S. Uh, and China, um, which, um, from my first remark, I said that it, it, Indonesia sees this as potentially, you know, destabilizing. Um, um, we feel like Southeast Asia is being the arena for this, but um, countries are making decisions that impact um, our region um, immensely. So uh, Indonesia's foremost concern, I think, is over the potential uh, manifestation of this great power competition in its own backyard, um, taking the form of military power projection, you know, especially using technologies that's like beyond um, Indonesia's capability to defend against. Uh, and I think this concern has been um, publicly um, um, stated as well. Um, and, uh, and I think in a way that uh, um, we are more concerned that um, initiatives like AUKUS, even though uh, from the, you know, the backgrounds, uh, the, the objective is actually to create um, um, stability in a way, but uh, our concern is that it's actually uh, going to be counterproductive for a lot of states uh, in the region, including Indonesia.
Now, when we touched on this um, a little bit earlier, talking about the, the cross-strait tensions, but I thought it was interesting from Xi Jinping's Party Congress speech over the weekend. He was quite emotional talking about uh, the topic of reunification, and perhaps that wasn't unsurprising. He refused to rule out the use of force, but, but it also felt like sticking status quo. Like, did, did it feel to you that there was any urgency when it comes to you know, making good on a lot of the threats that we have been worried about? Well, I, well, I think the Chinese are clearly been, well, they've clearly been telegraphing they don't like the direction of travel in Taiwan from their vantage point. And they particularly don't like the direction of travel internationally, particularly in Washington's policy. If you flip to Washington and Taipei, they don't like the direction of travel in China's policy toward Taiwan. So we have a situation that, you know, wherever you come down on this debate about whether China's trying to accelerate or decelerate, wherever you come down on that, I, I think the, the basic pillars that have kept the situation stable for several decades are eroding on all three sides of the triangle in Beijing, you know, the fact is the balance of power is shifting in China's favor, military power, economic power in ways that create temptations to leverage that power and to use the tools that, as I said earlier, China has acquired in the kit bag in a coercive way. On the Taiwan side, and I think the Chinese are well aware of this, a combination of generational change, uh, the fact that the bottom has basically fallen out politically from the Kuomintang party, the emergence of the Democratic Progressive Party is really a majoritarian political party at the national level. Um, and in Washington, the direction of travel that China sees as injecting ever greater levels of officiality into what China believed ought to be an unofficial relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan, if the U.S. was going to have any relationship with Taiwan at all, which China has always objected. Those are, those are, those are creating a sense of drift. And then in the United States, you know, and we can talk about American policy more generally, uh, I think you do have people who would basically like to relitigate the terms of normalization with China. So as all three of those things evolve, um, basically what you have is an erosion of the status quo. And so that's the context in which everybody is operating. I do think the United States and China in particular are just talking past each other. Um, the messaging out of Beijing Certainly since Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, met with Yang Jiechi, who's China's senior foreign policy maker, um, in Hawaii in the middle of 2020, has been that China regards the United States as walking away from a one-China policy. Now, the Biden administration rejects that, but I think the Chinese analysis of American policy is essentially that, to put it bluntly, the United States thinks as long as it says the words one China, it can do all sorts of things with Taiwan. And China's tried to abuse, disabuse the United States of that notion. But if you flip to Washington and Taipei, and there is a lot of concern, uh, notwithstanding what Mr. Xi may or may not have said about the direction of travel in Chinese policy. And the view, particularly in the United States, is that China intends to use the coercive tools it has. Um, and that those include a lot of things that are not just kinetic, um, and that invasion is not necessarily the only thing that is part of the plan. So there's a view that China's eroding the status quo in ways that are very threatening. And the debate about Ukraine has accelerated that debate here in the United States and in Taipei as well. So I think we have a very fundamentally unstable situation. And um, that's something that really is not fundamentally in the interest of people in Taiwan. So, so um, the salience of this issue is going to grow exponentially over the next couple of years. Raja, in the debate about Russia and Ukraine, it's been noted that the response from Delhi has been quite muted. You know, I haven't talked about this idea of a, a Beijing straddle. Is there a Delhi straddle going on? And what does that tell us about the commitment to you know, multilateral instruments and groupings like the Quad? No, just before I go to that, if I might just uh, put in a word on the question of uh, AUKUS and the Quad, if you will. I think growth in the Chinese military power dramatic expansion in the last 20 years. I'm not blaming them as a great power. They have every right to build what they think is uh, due there is. But military power and the will to exercise it produces consequences for the neighbors. So what you're beginning to see, I think AUKUS is just one manifestation that if China's capacity to use power to unilaterally change the territorial disposition, others are preparing for it. 
AUKUS is just one example of that. Uh, you see the Japanese are now talking about doubling their defense expenditure from around $40 billion today annually to about $80 billion in the next five years. Uh, you think of Japan spending $80 billion a year on defense uh, down the road. Uh, they're planning to, Japan is planning to build uh, a thousand missile arsenal to deal with uh, the kind of uh, challenges it faces on its borders, not just from China, Russia, and from uh, North Korea. You see South Korea building uh, ballistic missile submarines. So I think you're going to see a lot more militarization of Chinese periphery. So unless we construct back an equilibrium in which we say, look, we all agree to some rules of the road. Till then, I think we're going to see a phase of more intensive militarization. Those who are on the periphery and who feel the heat of the Chinese power. And there'll be some others who might just accommodate Chinese power. There will be others who will be neutralized on the periphery. But I think it's going to be a very, very different situation than we've had for the 30 years. Uh, on the Ukraine question, I mean, in a sense, what Russia has done in Europe is not very different from what China has done in South China Sea or what it has done in the Great Himalayas, which is, look, these territories belong to me. I have historic rights. Therefore, I'm just taking what belongs to me, which is exactly what Putin's argument uh, in, uh, in Europe is. For India, I think the problem is the straddle comes from the fact uh, we have a historic relationship with Russia which actually developed when China and Russia were at each other's throats in the 60s. So for historically, we saw Russia as a balancer against China. Uh, and today you have a situation where Russia and China are together. Uh, we have Chinese aggression on our frontiers. So therefore, the problem for India is how does it reduce its military dependence on, on Russia? The economic dependence has gone. I mean, today, India's trade with the U.S. is around $160 billion, and with Russia, it is about $10 billion. Uh, but there is a military dependence. So I think for India, the straddle is, in the next 10 years, how does India reduce its dependence on Russian military supplies? How does it diversify? How does it build its own military capabilities? That's where uh, India is headed. And I think the near term, Russia creates a problem for India by doing what it is doing in Europe where India's friends in the West want to see a far more clearer position. But I think, uh, uh, to be, give credit to the Biden administration, I think they've been understanding of where India comes from, and they're willing to cut some slack for India at this point. And India, in turn, uh, sees that, look, it needs to do a uh, lot more with the help of the West to build its own capabilities and reduce dependence on Russia in the coming years. I mean, you spoke earlier about the, the, the key differences between Beijing and Moscow and how China is a much more global power. And I think we can extend that to saying that Beijing has much more global ambitions, right? Where are the points where we could see China actually benefiting from a loss of Russian clout in Asia? Is there Russian clout in Asia? I mean, I, I've never thought of Russia as being a particular salient player in the region. It perhaps more Central Asia. Oh, in Central Asia? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I was the principal U.S. official for Central Asia in the kind of late-ish, mid-2000s. And the region's changed enormously, enormously, even in the 15 years since then. And it's certainly changed just, you know, exponentially even more since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, when people talk about Central Asia, there's a tendency to talk about the region as if they're objects of competition rather than the subjects of their own stories. And, and by the way, that's an endemic way of talking about a lot of other parts of the world, too. I hear that echoed, for instance, now in the way some people talk about the Pacific. But the reality is these countries not only have agency, they are increasingly confident in their ability to manipulate the competition of external powers in ways that allow them to exercise choice uh, to use some leverage, to bargain, to play these countries off against each other. And so those those metaphors that we sometimes hear about a great game, they begin to break down because actually, the, particularly the more powerful countries among them, countries like Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, which is the largest country in the region, have been very adept at fostering a balance of power that's enabled them to preserve and even bolster their independence. So I think that's the context in which outside powers are operating now. And you see it, for example, this new confidence in the way the region has reacted to the change in Afghanistan with the collapse of the former Islamic Republic and the rise of, to power of the Taliban. You know, 15 years ago, the reaction to that in the region, the last time the Taliban was in power, in power was, was to be terrified. Um, there was a lot of insecurity in the region. 
And today, nearly all of those governments are engaging with the Taliban, as Raja knows, and they're doing it from a place not of insecurity, but of confidence. So that confidence with Uzbekistan, for instance, driving what may eventually amount to a normalization process with Taliban-controlled Afghanistan reflects the way they deal with external powers generally. So if you now insert Russia and China into that equation, um, you know, Russia is a post-colonial power in that part of the world with, frankly, a post-colonial mentality and in some ways actually a hangover of a colonial mentality. There's a lot of sympathy toward Ukraine in the region. There's a lot of connections, for example, between civil society in Kazakhstan and civil society in Ukraine. And the Kazakh government, including President Takayev, have tweaked Russia in sometimes very public ways that have been noticed across the region and even across the world. Um, so I don't think the Chinese, even though they play the major economic role in the region now, should get too confident about all of this. Um, China's a trader, it's a builder, it's a lender, it's an investor, and this is a landlocked part of the world. And when you're landlocked, there's World Bank research that shows that being landlocked, it knocks about a point and a half off your GDP before you even get started, and that's just for a transaction cost. So creating economic and commercial opportunities in every direction on the compass not just north and west, which is what's been traditional, but to the major markets to the east and to the south, that's the game for Central Asians, to break out of their so-called land lockedness, but also to create strategic options and opportunities. So China's the heavy economically, Russia's been eclipsed, um, but uh, I think the region is concerned about the potential for Russian and Chinese collusion and pressure. That's why uh, the idea of a no limits partnership scares people in the region. And that's an opportunity for other external powers, for Turkey, for the United States, which has faded in the region, but still has some residual economic and commercial role for Europe for that matter. But I really want you to think about Central Asians being at the center of the story rather than just a playing field for contestation, because I think that's what's changed radically in the region over the last few decades. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, look, if you're a Kazakh or a Uzbek, what would you think? I mean, the Russian arguments on Ukraine, if they can do it to Ukraine on the basis of historic claims over those territories or of Russians present in these territories, Kazakhstan as a Russian minority. So the, so anyone who is, was part of the former Soviet Union would see, look, what they've done to Ukraine, they can do it to us any moment. And that conflicts with the historic dependence on Russia for security, even in the last 30 years. So therefore, I think uh, if Evan is right. I mean, they're all trying to diversify uh, in different ways so that uh, they can create some room for maneuver vis-a-vis -vis Russia and that they don't want to be in a position like Ukraine where they get Russia marching in, taking over. I mean, he talked about Tokayo of Kazakhstan. Russians saved Tokayo just in January, but after February, the entire approach of Kazakhstan is saying, look, we are not going to support the Ukraine invasion, uh, or the claim that there are independent uh, in Ukraine. So I think the Russia's action has actually weakened it uh, in Central Asia, and I think it opens up that space. Uh, Turkey is doing a lot more uh, there today. There's a Turkic Union, or what they call it, Turkic Council or something, called because these are speaking people. Uh, originally, they were called Turkestan. So I think you're going to see the whole space open up. And here again, Japan and Korea to historically have invested in this region. So my sense is you'll have a lot more possibilities for rest of Asia to engage in Central Asia. Uh, and my, uh, India too, I mean, is now stepping up its uh, security cooperation uh, with this region. So we need to pay a lot more attention to the interconnections uh, between uh, Central Asia and the rest of Eurasia, if you will, and the Indo-Pacific as well. I think the narrative of uh, smaller nations projecting confidence and autonomy agency and, and influence is something that we could, Katrina, extend to what we've been seeing with the Pacific nations and the to and fro from Canberra, from Beijing. Do you think Australia, given that it was clearly a top foreign policy objective and priority in the first days of this government, has successfully counteracted Beijing's many assertive overtures? Well, Heidi, what I would say is that Australia's relationship with the Pacific Islands is very, very long standing. We've been their partner for a very long time and, and continue to be. So our engagement with the Pacific Islands is um, uh, continues to be one partnering with them uh, to understand uh, what their needs are and to work with them on that. So we're very much part of the Pacific family.
uh, we see ourselves as that, we're seen as that in the region and we'll continue to work with each of those nations individually and with the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't be surprised to see an Australian government being fully engaged uh, both in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia because that is, that is a part of our, our neighbourhood. We've got a bit of time for questions, so um, please raise your hand if you're interested. I do just want to get one more question from myself to Shafia. In terms of where you sit, is there a view um, from Indonesia on uh, the role of Australia and how we've seen Australia converging in these major groupings like the Quad, like AUKUS, particularly in, in the scope of what we've been talking about as the, the periphery of Chinese militarization across the region? Sure, of course. I mean, um, Australia is a very important neighbor for, for Indonesia. And I think, um, you know, um, stability in the region affect uh, both Indonesia and Australia uh, in somewhat an, an equal uh, matter. Um, but with regards to initiatives like Quad, like AUKUS, I mean, like I said, um, um, us in Southeast Asia, there continues to be mixed feelings. Um, for example, about Quad, uh, perceptions vary by country. Um, countries like Vietnam has participated in, for example, pandemic-related dialogues with Quad members uh, and other partners. But I think um, most um, ASEAN nations remain uncomfortable, um, mainly because we see it as a well, quote unquote, a challenge to the ASEAN centrality, um, although uh, it may stretch it to um, um, quite an extent. Um, because, um, um, uh, for example, Indonesia feels that we've put so much effort into making sure that ASEAN provides a central platform within which um, regional institutions are anchored and Australia is, is a dialogue partner. So um, initiatives um, um, outside of the ASEAN platform is seen as um, creating instability for uh, the work of ASEAN. But there has been, um, I, have, I must um, emphasize that there has been a, big, uh, a bit of a shift in the perception in the past few years. Um, some surveys have shown that now um, Indonesia um, um, is more receptive towards um, ideas like Quad. Um, um, and, and also, and I think in several other um, Southeast Asian countries, um, there is an increase um, um, of um, um, respondents to some surveys saying that the strengthening of the quad um, in some areas like um, climate change, uh, pandemic cooperation is positive and reassuring for, for Southeast Asia as well. Um, uh, so in a way, um, for, for Indonesia, um, ASEAN platform is still the way to go, but we are um, trying our best to work um, with dialogue partners like Australia, of course. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Um, uh, on uh, Australia's uh, view of ASEAN, ASEAN centrality, and how that fits with AUKUS and Quad might just be useful uh, to make a few comments. Uh, certainly, um, ASEAN is very central um, uh, to Southeast Asia, and Australia's position is very, very clear on how it sees ASEAN. And I think our foreign minister has made that uh, very clear, including in um, excellent uh, speech uh, in Singapore earlier year where she uh, took some time to outline what Australia meant by ASEAN centrality. Um, but it's not ASEAN only. Uh, and uh, the Quad we see is a very practical partnership uh, with India, Japan in the United States, uh, where we can, uh, can provide medical support in the region, including and have done uh, to assist with COVID. Uh, Recovery, maritime, of that. Uh, in terms of AUKUS, I think it's really important to remember uh, that what Australia is doing in terms of the submarines is replacing submarines in two life. That was a process that was underway. Um, Australia is an island nation, so uh, naval power is, is a very important element of it. And it shouldn't be surprising that Australia would seek uh, to have the most advantage, and not just in, in submarines, but uh, across our uh, across our defence force. Uh, so when we're talking about um, a naval power and submarines in the region, I think it's really important to put in perspective uh, how many submarines Australia has and just uh, uh, what that means in terms of the region. So uh, I just wanted to make those clarifying points from Australia's perspective on some of the comments around uh, AUKUS Quad and how that fits in with Australia's 
uh, vision for the region. From just starting there, I mean, I think uh, there is clearly a concern in us about the Quad. All the Quad can swear by ASEAN centrality, but I think uh, they have a lot more tasks to do, reaching out to ASEAN collectively as well as individually, the members of ASEAN, to explain Quad's objective and why they're not in contradiction with its own uh, interests. But my sense is uh, there will be multiplicity of organizations. Uh, that there will be ASEAN. Uh, if there's no ASEAN, we'll have to invent one today. Uh, the Quad does a separate set of things. Soccer's will do a separate set of things. My sense is there will be a multiplicity of organizations given the scale of the challenges that are present. The trick for us is how do we work together uh, between ASEAN and the new multilateral institutions that are coming. We've got a little bit of time for any questions. No, thank you. Uh, my name is Colin Hisseltein, ex DFET, now Senior Advisor with Asia. I'd like to put a question to Raja, if I may, a little bit about his foreign policy position in the region. I wonder if we could drill down a little further. There is in this country uh, a lot of focus on the AUKUS, but in particular the Quad. Uh, and I think in some quarters, expectations have been raised very high about the role of, uh, of, of the Quad, and in particular uh, India, which is seen in many quarters as the great balancer uh, towards uh, to China. Some of this, it seems to me, is a bit uh, overdrawn. But I wonder if you could just um, give some idea of what realistic expectations we might have about the role that India will play in the Quad. I note that you're, India is also a member of this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So uh, you can see a bit more. Look, I think uh, India's uh, slow boat. I mean, it has changed a lot, and uh, so don't expect dramatic moves in terms of it. what we've seen happen in the last ten years, uh, from being very non-aligned, very pro-Russia, very you know, engaging China, to one where the threats it faces today have moved towards building stronger coalitions with the Western world. That's a historic shift, I think, in India's approach from really a post-colonial state keeping the US-UK away from it to one where it is actively collaborating with the US, with UK, with the European powers, as well as America's allies in Asia. That is the big shift that is taking place. So I think it will happen because uh, uh, it is a question of the, the progress will be slow. The tomorrow quad is not an quad. I think India has made it clear. It is not, does not want the Quad to be a military alliance. But there is military cooperation between India and the US, between India and Australia, between India and Japan, and the four of them exercise together in the Malabar. So it is not that India is not doing anything. But the Quad, if you hear earlier, look, if you make Quad a military institution, I think the, your problems in ASEAN, your problems in the rest of Asia will only grow. So I think the court should stick to non-military, non-traditional security threats and engage the region through public goods. What, it, what India does, because it faces uh, other challenges, that it can work with these new partners to build security cooperation. And I would also say, uh, while India has moved closer to the West than ever been before, that it's not going to be a treaty partner of the US. We're not going to sign a treaty alliance nor is America offering us one. So, so there is no offer of a new treaty that, look, America will defend India against China on the Great Himalayas. We're not asking for it. I think India is going to defend itself on the borders. But the areas where broader equilibrium, I keep coming back to the term, building a broader equilibrium in Asia that has been destabilized by Chinese unilateralism. For that, I think India will continue to work. And my sense is, there is very good understanding today between Delhi, Canberra, Tokyo, and the United States. And the need to work with other powers as well, with France in the Western Ocean, a whole range of actors in Europe. So I think my sense is it is a, a slow process, but I think it has moved by Indian pace at least quite quickly in the last five years. And again, I say, look, the Chinese have really pushed us into thinking afresh about our condition and what we need to do with other partners. So to move slowly move at India's own pace, but I think uh, both Canberra, Tokyo, and Washington realize the importance of India in producing a balance, in producing an equilibrium uh, in this part of the world. Time for more questions, if there are any. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, hi, um, I'm Lachlan. My question is mostly directed towards uh, Shafia. I'm curious if you think the um, the geostrategic tensions kind of in the medium to long term are more likely to unite ASEAN more um, and kind of lead to a greater common Southeast Asian voice, or if you think it's ultimately going to fracture the organization or at least impose more limits on, on cooperation within the region. Sure, thanks. Um, can I answer directly? Um, yeah, um, I do think that um, 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 ASEAN is going through a lot of cha uh, cha um, uh, challenges, uh, and I think um, you know we've heard several criticisms about about ASEAN, and I think it, it has more to do with internal um, of ASEAN itself, um, the, the structure of the organization, um, uh, the, the the whole system uh, upon which the the, um, the organization is built. Um, rather than you know um, pressures from from external, I mean pressures. Yes, um, they present challenges, but I think what ASEAN needs to do is more uh, internally. So uh, um, I do think that unless um, uh, internal challenges of ASEAN can be uh, dealt with by the members um, themselves, you know, be it through reform, be it through um, other measures, um, um, there is only so much that the external pressures can do to actually. Uh, create a change uh, towards the working of ASEAN. So, uh, yes, um, I think most of the criticisms towards ASEAN are, are valid. Uh, and I do believe that um, ASEAN needs to go through um, one way or the other a reform. Um, um, uh, and I do think that, you know, um, external pressures, um, challenges, um, increased tensions in the region will put more um, pressure towards the organization. But I think the, the changes itself uh, must come from um, internal uh, uh, the organization. Do we have any more questions before we... I, mean, I actually have a last question in terms of just maybe going around and getting a, a pulse check when it comes to the future of globalization and multilateralism starting here in Asia. It feels like every time we meet at an event like this, we talk about the fracturing, the fragmentation, the decoupling between major powers. Are things really as hopeless as <laughs> we would make it seem, or do you think there are still green shoots when it comes to the future of not just multilateral trade, but also diplomatic relationships? Ivan, maybe I'll start off with you. Um. Well, the United States is in, a, in an odd place because its role in your part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific, traditionally has been to be a leader both as a provider of security-related public goods, but also of economic-related public goods and other benefits. And the reality is American security leadership, as we've been discussing, is not really in jeopardy. And it's not in jeopardy because fear of China is endemic across the region. And that being the case, the United States was, is, and as far as my eyes can see, going to continue to be an important provider of security, either directly as to its allies uh, or indirectly for those who are able to free ride off the security that those alliances provide. And that will be the case until China and Japan have essentially the kind of moment analogous to what France and Germany had in Europe, which would make uh, collective security possible in ways that it, it simply is not. The problem for the United States, and you're beginning to get at this when you mentioned trade, is that the security role was not the end of America's role in the region, and particularly not of American leadership. American leadership in the region was also premised on being a demand driver and on a rule setter and standard setter. And there, the American demand profile remains important, but it's shrinking in relative terms, even though in some respects it's growing in absolute terms. And so that would make, to your point about globalization, the American role as a standard setter, rule writer, norm setter, that much more important. But for a variety of reasons, many of which have to do with our domestic politics, the United States has chosen to withdraw from that role. So whether it's the CPTPP or the RCEP or the DIPA, you know, the United States has chosen to have its nose pressed against the glass on the outside looking in. And if the United States is not going to rediscover its role as a standard setting nation, then what it's going to find is globalization will continue because we have best in class multinational companies. But business can take place no matter who writes the rules. American business has been operating in China under Chinese rules, German business in Russia under Russian rules, and that can continue to be the case. So I think the predicament the U.S. finds itself in is that it's increasingly 
in a position where it needs to rediscover its role as a standard setting nation. And if it doesn't, then globalization will continue, but it will be on a more regionalized basis. And it will be business rather than the American government as a standard setter that continues to basically define the American profile in your part of the world. Yeah, that's interesting, this idea that, that the business leaders of the business world will set the norms and fill that vacuum. There is a vacuum then that's being le left for the potential of emerging nations, no? Look, I mean, I would say, then following up on what Evan said, look, the, we all believe that the post-91 world of globalization was an irreversible uh, epitome of human evolution. But just before 1991 and after 1945, there was a world of GATT that was also a relatively free trading nation, but it left a lot of room for states to engage with each other. Uh, my sense is the, that the idea that you can have uncritical globalization that would simply let the business or the capital to do what it wants. Uh, I think if you see the US national security strategy, it's saying, look, how it affects the people will affect democratic elections and democracies. So I think there will be some recalibration. This doesn't mean every country is going to go back in. So there's going to be adjustments made to the world of 1991. Second, the business you talked about, look, the sense, the masters of the universe, initially in the Wall Street and later in Silicon Valley, the sense they don't need the states. They can simply do what is good for them and that the borders don't matter. Again, I think they went too far with that today. The state is back. The state is back in a big way. Because in the end, even in democracies, you have to respond to the popular aspirations. So whether it is the control of big tech or bringing the large companies in line with the national interest, whether it's in the US or in China, that is beginning to unfold. My sense is both in Russia and China, the future of integration, both these countries have had long traditions of westernization. So whether it is Tsar Putin or Emperor Xi, they're not immortal. There are forces in both the countries which want a reasonable relationship in the West. And I think those forces will assert at some point. So I think we should all be open for a potential for cooperating with Russia, because without Russia, you can't construct a security order in Europe. Nor can we build anything stable without eventual Chinese support for a system in Asia. So I think we need to keep up that engagement. So that again, I'll come back to the notion that if we want equilibrium in Europe or Asia, we need to have a, a, a serious engagement with both Russia and China. But the question is, what are the terms? That it can't be that they can do unilaterally what they want. It is working out those conditions under which we can live in uh, you know, mutual respect as well as uh, common prosperity for everyone. That's where I think it is that renegotiation, which is now today the challenge for us and not fundamentally isolating China or Russia forever. Katrina, a final word from you. Can Australia help fill that gap in terms of becoming a standard setter, a norm setter? Uh, thanks, Heidi. Um, without assuming, um, you know, the gap that, uh, that the United States had and didn't have as Evan postulates and that there's a gap, I just make a couple of overarching points. Um, it's a very uh, complex confluence of events that we are witnessing right now. We're seeing the sharp geostrategic competition. Uh, that's a global competition, but it's very much playing out sharply in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we are still recovering from the impacts of COVID. There's a lot of reconstruction and recovery um, that uh, has uh, uh, yet to be done. We saw supply chains tested uh, during the COVID uh, crisis. Then we have an unexpected uh, a land war uh, on Europe with uh, Russia's uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine, which is a flagrant violation of, of the UN Charter that has caused shockwaves for many reasons, including that the fact that the international law has been breached so, uh, so openly. But it's also had international economic consequences exacerbating food shortages, energy shortages. We're seeing price rises that are affecting uh, our region, uh, cooking oil, energy prices. So that's affecting uh, individuals as well. Uh, and um, we all know, of course, that in international relations, uh, we can't entirely predict the future because it depends very much 
on the actions of nation states and other players, and particularly the larger states. So the big powers certainly have uh, an obligation as big powers to ensure that the tensions that we're witnessing uh, don't bubble over into conflict. Uh, but the middle powers and the smaller powers that we see uh, in our region and elsewhere uh, also have a role to step up and help to shape the new dynamic, whether that's a new regional dynamic or a new global dynamic. Um, and to answer your question in a, in, a, in a long way, yes, Australia and other nations uh, that aren't big power players do have a very important role in setting rules, um, following the rules, um, making sure that those norms are understood and that the importance of following those, those rules are understood. Because if not, if we do not have predictability, if we do not have rules and norms that are understood and followed, then, then what, what do we have to guide us? Um, and so it is incumbent upon all of those countries to, to play a role. Um, I'll go back to the institutions that are in the region that are vitally important and how other emerging uh, arrangements like like Quad, which is you know is not a is not a sort of pact or a, a military arrangement, but can work alongside those institutions to complement what those institutions are doing. Uh, so there's certainly a very important role for all countries, uh, all countries in the nation, uh, in the in the in the world, and in the region. And uh, Australia will certainly be working very hard uh, um, in building dialogue and partnerships with those countries and encouraging um, that sort of respect for the rules and the norms so that while we are all trying to address the challenges that we faced and that we saw during COVID, the impacts of the financial situation, the in impacts of war, trying to make sure that uh, the supply chain issues that we saw aren't repeated, so there's some sort of national resilience, but without retreating back into nationalism so that we have still open trading and positive partnerships. Um, we'll be working very hard uh, in the region to do that and, and uh, confident that other countries in the region will do likewise. On that note, I think that wraps up our morning panel. and.